This morning we're going to look at real faith. Last week, if you were here, we talked about having a desperate faith. We focused on our hopeless situation and we looked at the, the woman with the issue of blood and, and how she was without hope and, and, and that desperate faith that, that she had to just to reach out and touch the hem of uh, the garment that Jesus had on and she was healed. And we found out that she was not only healed, but she was also uh, saved and eternally healed as well by, by her faith. And we talked about how it wasn't necessarily a great faith, but it was faith. And, and it was not just about the faith, it was the object of her faith, that she had put her faith in Jesus. So today, uh, I want to build off that a little bit. And we're going to look in Matthew uh, chapter 7 and do that, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to talk about real faith. Talk about real faith, because if there's real faith, obviously there's there's fake faith or, or, or not sincere faith. And so uh, this morning's going to going to be a little touchy uh, and it's going to and it's going to it's going to cause us to have to, to to do some some tough thinking and some think think uh ponder on some things that maybe we don't want to think about. Uh, but but we need to do these things to to help us to move forward as a church. So have you ever like come to on a Sunday morning or, or, or you know, we get wrapped up in the, the busyness of the Sunday school hour and then we move right into the worship hour and we kind of hustle and bustle. And so if we're not careful, we kind of miss out on what's going around us. We miss the, the people around us. But have you ever paused for a minute and looked around the room and just to notice who's missing? Who's not here anymore? Who may have came for a little while and then they didn't come anymore? Uh, who has come before the church, made a profession, baptized even, and, and, and hung around for a little while and they're gone, they're not here anymore? You ever wonder about those folks? Right? What happened there? What, what's going on in those situations? It, it breaks your heart because if you were to, to look at our church records, and that's one of the things before I came, I, I looked at the the annual reports, the, the reports that get turned into the, the, uh, the association or, or even the, the Southern Baptist Convention, these annual reports will show number of baptisms, number of, uh, of new additions, new members, all those things. And so you look at those, those numbers over the years and say for the last 10 years, you know, you'll have, you know, you know, three, six, eight, ten, right? And these numbers are piling up over a 10-year period. And then you come here and you look around, it's like, where are they at? Where are they? Because according to our, our, our statistics and our numbers, there should be a lot more people in this room than there are. Right? And that should be not only concerning to me as the pastor, but concerning to you as, as the congregation. Because we've got some folks that are missing in action for whatever reason. So I want us to look at this passage today to kind of get our minds to start thinking about maybe what's going on. Because usually when you find something going, that something's not right, don't you not, you need to do a little, little reflecting and, and do a little self-evaluation about what's going on. Because it's, it's not a good thing to just ignore the problem. Amen? It's not a good thing to just kind of turn a blind eye to it. Uh, whenever I found the, the lump in my armpit, right, if I would have just blew it off as being nothing, I probably wouldn't be here right now, right? Ignoring the problem doesn't fix anything. Amen? Y'all know that. Y'all know that. In real life, that doesn't matter. And so if you just keep ignoring the problem spiritually, if you keep ignoring the problem as a church, guess what? There won't be no church. There won't be no church. When, when this generation dies off, there will be no occupying number two. Right? So we need to get to the bottom of what's happening here and what's, what's going on. So today it's going to sting a little bit, but it's a good kind of pain. We need to do these things. We need to have this little talk this morning. So we say, so why is that? Why are, are some missing? Where are all the people at that are, that are made professions, that have joined? Lots of things could, could have happened. Uh, some, right, get their feelings hurt and leave. That's true. That happens at every church. That happens. People get their feelings hurt and leave, and it's sad, but that's, that's a reality. Uh, and here's another one that's pretty common. They just don't like the preacher, right? Either you don't like, my, like the personality or don't like his style or maybe he preaches too long or maybe he preaches on things you don't like to hear, right? It could be anything. So they just don't like the preacher, so that's why they don't come. Some move away, right? That happens. Then they've joined other churches, and that's great. That's great. I love to hear that somebody's moved to a new community, and I hear that they've plugged in and they found a place, and they're serving and using their gifts. That's awesome. That's wonderful. Another reality is some have passed away. We've lost some of our saints, a lot of our saints over the last few years, just, just the numbers, right? right? Some pass away. 
Some have health issues, and now they're homebound, so that might be uh, some. You know, we have some of our members now are homebound, can't make it uh, to the church, uh, church house. And then there's another group that says that, you know, it's kind of it's our fault. It's kind of the church's fault that some of these aren't around anymore. Some say that the church didn't do enough to follow up or keep them involved. Right? It's, there may be some truth to that. I think there is a measure of truth to that, that, that sometimes when we have people join the church and uh, get baptized, we have no system in place to, to, to include them and disciple them, do we? We just expect them to come to Sunday school, but we don't really have an intentional plan about when, when you're a new believer, I'm going to pair you up with a mature believer and, and, and you're going to disciple this young man or this young lady. Man to man, woman to woman, right? We don't have those type of things. So there's some measure of truth to that. But I think John MacArthur is, uh, is on to something here. He's on to, he's on to what the real problem is. Because we, we have lots of reasons that this is happening. But I think he has a good idea. This is what he says. The greatest problem in evangelism is not follow-up, but conversion. That's a good statement. Let me read one more time. Listen to that. The greatest problem in evangelism is not follow-up, but conversion. Right follow-up is not nearly so difficult as right conversion. Follow-up is the hardest when conversion is the easiest. Because easy conversion is frequently no conversion. The unconverted are indeed hard to follow up, whereas those who are truly come to Christ, are eager to learn from His Word and associate with His people. I think he nailed it. I think he nailed it. The, the, the reality, the cold reality is, think about yourself, your own situation. When you came to faith, sure you had to be encouraged. and We all need to be encouraged daily. But did you have to be begged and pleaded with to, 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 to get you to come to the church house, to come to... Uh, to come to church, did, did you have to be? Did that have to happen for you? Did you or did you want God's word? Did you want to grow in your faith? Did you want to know more about God? Did you want to be with God's people? Was it was it a natural overflow of your conversion? Right, it's natural. It's as natural as breathing, isn't it? If you're God's child, you want to be with God's family. Amen. I mean, that's that's natural. I, I, that those two go together. So uh, the reality is that the, the, maybe the problem isn't where are they. The problem, the reality is, were they ever converted? Yes, professions were made. Yes, baptized. Yes, transferred letters. But the proof's in the pudding, right? Don't tell me. Show me. Show me. Right? Many people are simply proving that they've built their spiritual house on sand instead of the rock. That's what we're seeing. I think that's a big part of what we're seeing. And I'd have to say much blame goes to pastors that are more interested in meeting a quota than discipling those that make professions. Right? We want to make, keep our numbers up. We want to, want to you know, make that bottom line look good. We want to make that annual report look good, right? We need to get some people to, to make some decisions. Discipleship is where you'll find out whether somebody's converted or not, whether somebody's saved or not. That's where you'll find out. That one-on-one, that life-on-life, that's when you're going to start seeing it. You'll, you'll see it. You'll see growth. You'll see a desire for holiness. You'll see brokenness over sin. And you'll see their brokenness over the lostness around them. You'll see all those things in discipleship, right? And when I say discipleship, not necessarily our, our discipleship time at 5 o'clock in Bible study. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about intentional time spent together, one-on-one or in small groups, outside of the church, life-on-life, doing service things together, counseling one another. You'll know that. You'll see those things, but it takes that. You won't know it if you're never around people. If you're not being discipled, you'll never know it. Sometimes we don't want to know, right? We don't want to know the truth. We want, we're, we're glad that they, they made a, a profession. We're glad we baptized them. We, the church claps and we celebrate but then that's the end. That's the end. Party's over. We got the number. We got the number. We got our report filled out. We got another check for the book, right? And, and that person just fades away. Sad. It's sad. Preachers get, get, wrapped, up, rip, get wrapped up in preaching uh, cheap grace or easy believism. 
right? Fire insurance. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? No commitment, no expectations. Just, just, just come on down, right? How about prolonged altar calls. Y'all, y'all been part of those before? Man, they play through just as I am like 15 times until somebody moves. Somebody will come down just so we'll stop playing. Like somebody do something, right? Just drag it on. Gonna, gonna, uh, somebody's going to make a decision and we're not going to stop playing. Uh, manipulation tactics, right? Manipulation. I know y'all can't believe this, but preachers tend to, to, to manipulate people from the pulpit. Can you believe that? Yeah. Got a lot of influence. You add Jesus on anything, you can manipulate a, a whole lot of people, right? Just throw some Jesus in there. Try to scare the hell out of you, right? Literally, right? You don't want to go to hell, do you? Nobody wants to go to hell. Well, come on down. Let me tell you about that. Mm-hmm. Or here's another one. How about just trying to guilt you? Preachers are good at doing that too, making you feel guilty. Making you feel, I'm probably doing it right now. I don't even, don't even intend to. I'm probably making some people feel guilty right now. That's not my intent. Right? Make you feel guilty, make you feel sad, tell some emotional stories, play some videos of some sad things, some sad, you know, to, and, and get you all worked up and then got you set up for the kill. Now we're going to do the invitation time, got you all teary eyed. Right? High pressure sales tactics. Right? To really, really crank it up. That's me or the pastor trying to manipulate you into making a decision that may, may or may not be sincere. It's devastating. When God draws a person to himself, we don't have to beg and plead with him to make a decision. Right? And I pray, I say it today, and I hope I always say it, I'm not that guy. I hope I never turn into that guy. I'm going to preach the Bible, and I'm going to explain it to you the best I know how. And the rest is between you and the Holy Spirit. Right? You know, I hope I'm never that guy. I hope I never get so caught up in numbers. I hope I never uh, feel pressure to, to do those things. To coerce somebody into making a decision that may or may not be sincere. So let's look at our passage this morning. This morning we're going to look at the, the closing declaration that Jesus made at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He's going to give us a clear, side-by-side view of a person, one with real faith and one with fake faith. Between Christians and church people, right? Because there's a difference. Do you all know that? There's a difference between church people and Christians. They're, They're two different people, right? Between disciples of Jesus and converts to a religious system. And I think it's going to help us to shed some light on where all our missing people are. So Jesus describes two, hear, two types of hearers, one wise and one foolish. One built their spiritual home on the rock, right, God's word, and one built their spiritual home on sand, right, self-righteousness. Let's look at our text. Matthew seven twenty four to 27. Therefore, whoever hears these words, hears these sayings of mine, and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its its fall. Father, we ask you to help us to work through this text this morning, Father. I pray that you reveal to us what you'd have us to know from this passage, Father. I pray that we'd all be honest this morning before you, God. Father, that we would not be overcome by guilt or, or, or feel as though we've did anything wrong to, to cause this, Father. It's not about that, Father. It's, it's about us seeing what's really happening, Father. It's about us truly uh, seeing the needs in this community. It's about us being able to, to follow up, Father, to be able to reach out to the unconcerned, Father, in, in our midst, in our community, Father. Help us, God. Help us to be 
faithful to this text this morning. Help us to glean everything we need to glean from these precious words. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So just a little bit of background. Again, I've already said this is the tail end of the Sermon on the Mount between uh, chapter 5 or chapters 5, 6, and 7 is known as the Sermon on the Mount. And so the listeners that, that Jesus was speaking to, a lot of them would, would be, you know, nomadic in their, in their lifestyle, the, the shepherd's way of life. And so what they would do, they would move from place to place following their flocks since they were used to setting up dwelling places, temporary dwelling places. And the ones who were wise would find a good, a good place with a good foundation, uh, maybe higher, at a higher elevation, whereas the unwise or the foolish would just set up anywhere, right? Just set up anywhere, just throw it up, and they may be thinking, well, we're only here a little while, so what's the big deal? But in the Palestinian deserts, we're known to having these, these, these thunderstorms that would come along quickly, and what they would do, they'd cause flash flooding. If you've, if you've ever been anywhere in, a, uh, in, the, in the, uh, like Arizona or I like to watch those shows, the survival shows, dual, dual survival. I think that's one of them. The other night they were, I think, in Utah, and they were in a dry desert place, and they had these canyons that were just washed out uh, from the flash floods, and, and they were trying to get to some water down at the bottom, and they kept making note of, like, we need to get in there and get out quick because if, if those storm clouds come and we get, a, we get rain, a big storm comes, we're done for because a flash flood will just, that water will build up quickly and rush through, and you're gone. And so that's what Jesus was talking about, for them to understand. They can identify. They've seen it. They've seen those storms come along, and they've seen houses get swept away, dwelling places swept away. These tents get swept away because they weren't on high ground or on good ground. So they knew quite well what he was talking about. Wise people build on the rock. Foolish people will build on the sand. Right? So let's look at our, our text. Let's work our way through it. The first thing we see from our passage this morning that people with real faith are obedient to God's word. People with real faith are obedient to God's word. Uh, we see in our, in our verse in verse 24 and 26, both of them, both were exposed to the same teachings. Right? Both were sitting there the whole time and listening to the whole Sermon on the Mount. Both of them were exposed to the same teachings, but... Uh, one was obedient and the other was disobedient. So this all goes back to what we keep saying. I keep saying it and you're probably getting tired of hearing it. We need to know God's word, but we also need to do God's word. Right? Knowing and doing is what we're talking about. It appears that both men knew and understood the teachings of Jesus. Right? They understood. They said they took all this, all this in. Uh, it wasn't that they were confused. They, they heard it well. They both could have been Bible drill champions, right? They had a great, maybe had great memories, and they had it down pat. They could quote it back to you. However, knowing what the Bible says isn't, isn't enough. We know that. We know that. Knowing what the Bible says isn't enough. Doing what it says is clear. It's a clear indication of real faith. Doing what the Bible says is an indication of real faith. And we see that uh, going back to this verse. It would be familiar for those of you who have been coming on Sunday nights. In our study through 1 John, uh, we know it's an it's a evidence of saving faith. Uh, John says in 1 John 2, uh, 3 through 6, he says, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him, and by this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk, just as he walked. Right? It's pretty clear, isn't it? It says right there in black and white. So let me give you a warning. We can all sit in this room week after week and year after year, nodding our heads in agreement and saying amen and still perish in our sins. Y'all doing it right now. <laughs> right? Amen. We nod our heads and we, we read it, right? We read the word. We read it for ourselves. You got your own copy of scriptures there and we say amen to it. But the key is doing what it says, right? Do what it says. People with real faith are obedient to God's word. The second thing we see from this passage is that people with real faith are committed to God's mission. People with real faith are committed to God's mission, right? Both men build houses. And in this case, the houses represent their lives. They both built their lives based off of what they heard or what they believed. The wise man reordered his life with the priorities of Jesus. 
That's a big, big, big key word there. He reordered his life. Put things different. New priorities. Right? His calendar was reordered. Right? Worship, being in church was important. Serving one another was important. Uh, being involved in the mission. Take precedence over other things. Right? His spiritual walk, being part of the team, following Jesus was important. His finances were reordered. Right? He supported the ministry in meeting the needs of others. He didn't look at, he didn't look at his, his income as, as his to do what he wanted with. He saw it as a tool. His view of people was reordered. He saw people like Jesus did. He had compassion on the lost and those in need. Right? The foolish man, on the other hand, his life, his life makes church and following Jesus more like a hobby than a lifestyle. Makes church and following Jesus more like a hobby than a lifestyle. And what do I mean by that? His calendar, his calendar is ordered based off of whatever suits his fancy. Right? I might be there. I might not. Depends on what's going on. Right? Church, serving, and mission only happen if a schedule allows for it. Right? If I can make it, I can make it. If I can't, I can't. And according to his finances, he's a tipper. He's a tipper and not a tither. He's a tipper and not a tither. Drops in a little cash in the plate just so he looks good. All right, just for appearance's sake. He has no plan for regular giving. His money is used to build his kingdom and not God's. Right. He still has an owner's mentality instead of a steward's mentality. Let me just say another little footnote on, on the, the thing about our, our obligation or, or our blessedness to be able to, to give financially. Because this is the truth I found in my own life early on. I had to as a believer. Um, if you don't make a plan to give regularly, you never will. You never will. You never will. Something will always come up. So what, what Leslie and I have done early on you know that was a big thing because if, if you're looking at, at, at money y'all probably right now say oh lord here he goes talking about money you really meddling this morning but it's for your good it's for your good to be faithful with what he's given us we learned early on that what we do is it comes out first it comes out first whatever our income is whatever we we have that check gets wrote and it's set on the on, on the on the on the side of the computer and then the rest of the bills come after that. That's how we do it. That doesn't make us, you know, great or awesome or any hold anybody else. I'm just saying that's what works for us. That's what we have to do. Because if we don't, if, 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 if we get around to the end and bills get paid and what, this and that, we want to go out to eat or this and that, at the end of the week and, and when time comes, what you, what you give into the Lord, there ain't nothing left. It's all gone. So his, his comes out first. And I think that's biblical and right. Right? Just add to your budget right off the top. Also, getting back to the foolish man, here's a key to it as well. He might be a nice guy. Probably is a nice guy. Polite and courteous. But he sees people as a means to an end. Sees people as a means to an end. Uses people to meet his needs. Right? How can they benefit his purposes and not the other way around? Not interested in serving but interested in being served, right? Wise and foolish. So at this point, you, you might be getting kind of uncomfortable. Or are you starting to identify with either one of these men yet? Does either one of these men kind of sound like you this morning? Is people with real faith are obedient to God's word. People with real faith are committed to God's mission. People with real faith will survive the storms. People of real faith will survive the storms. Both men experience the storms of life. Nobody escapes the storms. Nobody. Right? They come for us all. Right? Because storms are tests is what they are. They're tests. Some, uh, the storms uh, will reveal who we really are and where we really place our faith. Right? I've said it before that everybody is, is a strong Christian when everything's going well. Everybody loves God when things are going well. The, the, the true test is, do you still love God when things aren't going well? 
when you get that bad report, do you still love God? When that, you lose that loved one, do you still love God? Are you still faithful? Do you still love God when you get fired from your job six months before your retirement date? Do you still love God? Right? Test. Storms are tests. And so when you look at the, the word used here for testing, when you think about in the ancient days, they didn't have the blessing of, of Tupperware. Anybody have Tupperware in here? Or something similar to Tupperware? It could be Rubbermaid. Just, man, man, thank God for storage containers, plastic storage containers. Our refrigerator has, you know, we just, they're just stacked up in there. Now, you got to date those things because you kind of start to, if you have to ask what this is because it's like change consistencies and colors, throw it away. Throw it away. Don't open it in the house either. Do it outside. All right? Well, they didn't have that in, in those days. In the ancient times, they didn't have Tupperware. And, and, and their, their, their pottery was made out of clay that they would, would bake and it would harden. But sometimes in the process, it would crack. It would, it would crack. So you have some of these kind of sh- uh, shady business dealers who were selling this pottery. Uh, they would put wax. They would put wax to fill in these cracks. And then they would paint over it so you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't see it. You wouldn't know it's cracked at all. It would look perfect whenever you go to buy it. But when you get it home and you put something hot in there, you know what happens to that wax when you add that hot liquid or put it, put it on the fire? You know what happens? That wax melts. And next thing you know, your dinner's running out the bottom of the bowl or it falls apart on you. So it wasn't until the pot gets used that the cracks were discovered. And it's the same way for you and I. Right? It's the same way for you and I. Sometimes it isn't until these storms of life show up that the cracks in our faith start to make themselves known. Storms show us the cracks in our faith. Let's jump ahead a little bit in Matthew to chapter 13. I think because this kind of transitions into what we're talking about a little better. We started in 7, now we're going to hop to 13, to Matthew chapter 13. And this is the section known as the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower, because I want us to to think about in God's word, and and he shows us different types of hearers, different types of soul that people are, and how they respond to God's word. Matthew 13, verses 3 through 9. says, Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and he sowed. Some seed fell by the wayside. And the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they were withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so the disciples and the rest of the crowd were sitting there scratching their head and they didn't quite get this because the parables are confusing. They're like, I'm not really sure what this means. Why does he, why does he just come out and say it? And so he departs and goes with the disciples and, 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 and they ask, what did you mean by that? And he kind of, one of those instances, he says, oh, you have little faith. I got to explain everything to you guys. Let me, let me explain it. So he, he picks up again in verse 18. He explains the parable of the sowers to him. He says, uh, therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked would comes and snatches away what has, was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. Wow, that sounds kind of like what we're talking about this morning, doesn't it? Endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. In verse 22, now he receives seed. Now he who receives seed among the thorns is he who hears the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word. And he becomes unfruitful. But look at verse 23. It's not all bad. Not all bad news, but he who receives seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So according to Scripture, according to God's word, there are four types of hearers, four types of people. And the first one, the wayward, the wayside ground here, 
This is the hard-hearted individual. The hard-hearted individual. And this sounds weird, but I have a lot of, I have, I have probably more respect for the hard-hearted than for somebody who's just kind of playing the game. It may sound weird, but, but, but the one who flat out says, I'm not interested, I'm not interested, I, I understand what you're saying, and I appreciate you saying that, I don't believe what you believe, and I know where they stand. I have more respect for them than somebody who just wants to be strung along or just kind of playing the game. I know where I stand with them, those type of folks that say those type of things. And I've ran into several of them. That, that kind of describes my dad, unfortunately. So continue to pray that God would soften his heart. These are the ones who never receive the word of God. They can't understand it, and they have no desire to understand it. Right? That's the wayside ground here. Then you have the, the stony ground here. Uh, these are the people with issues. Right? They have issues, there's troubles, and they're just looking for answers. These are the ones that usually we can, we can do an altar call, and depending on what's going on in their lives, we can get them to move. We can get them to respond. They're, they're the emotional response uh, that you usually see. But when trouble comes, they disappear. Right? When trouble arises, that's the ones that, that kind of thin out pretty quick. And then the third one we see there was the, thir- the thorny ground here. And just to sum it up, what, to describe the thorny ground here, just, to, just to, to make it simple, just kind of make a broad statement, uh, these are the ones that are just too much in love with this world. They're just too much in love with this world. There's, there's just too much here that they want to do and be involved in that, that they don't have time for, for God's mission, God's people, God's church, none of those things. They're just too busy to be saved. Right? And then the last one, are the good ground hearers. These are the ones who have real faith. Real faith. And if you're doing the math, we've talked about four different types of hearers, four different types of responses. What's one out of four? Any of my math people? What percentage is that? What's one out of four? 25%. 25% of the hearers are, 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 are exhibiting real faith. That probably bears out, right? Does that sound about right? That might be kind of high. One out of four profession of faith is a, is a real profession of faith on average, according to this passage. Do y'all see that? That probably bears out. That's probably pretty close, wouldn't you say? 25%? Because the Bible also says that broad is the way that leads to destruction and narrow is the way that leads to eternal life. And few that find it, right? It bears out. So this is all coming together for you, hopefully, that you're starting to see what we're, we're doing here. The good ground here is known for hearing the word, understanding the word, and applies the word. Right? He's the one that bears fruit. Bears fruit. Some more than others, but he's bearing fruit. Good fruit. Uh, they're the ones who that, that have foregone the American ideology of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They've kind of set that off to the side. They have a new ideology. They've chosen death, servanthood, and holiness instead. Right? Not life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They're, they've chosen death, servanthood, and holiness in its place. People with real faith choose to die daily to self. People with real faith choose to die daily to self. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We also see that people with real faith choose to serve others rather than being served. People with real faith choose to serve others rather than being served. Get this example from Jesus himself. Mark 10.45 It says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. We also see that people with real faith choose holiness over happiness. People with real faith choose holiness over happiness. Now, I kind of feel like I need to give a little bit more to that because sometimes you say, well, and we're known for it sometimes, in our, in our attempt to be reverent, uh, in, our, in our worship gatherings, we, we kind of feel uh, constrained to express ourselves. And sometimes, if y'all could see what, you, what y'all look like from up here sometimes, you would, you would, think, that, you would think that I'm uh, 
you know, just nothing but bad news, right? We have these sourpuss looks on our face, right? And we, we're, this, we have the joy of the Lord, we're supposed to have the joy of the Lord. So, so holiness is not opposed to happiness, right? They, they work together. If you're holy, you will be happy. I'm talking about the type of happiness that, that's kind of contingent on your circumstances, right? The pursuit of happiness. You know, if I do this, I'm happy. If I'm with these people, I'll be happy. If I buy new stuff, I'm happy. That's what I'm talking about. Holiness and happiness aren't necessarily opposing ideas. If you're holy, truly holy, you will be happy. You will be happy. I, I assure you of that. So in 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16, Peter says this. It says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Right? Be holy for I am holy. People with real faith choose holiness over happiness. So in closing this morning, right? what have you built your life on? Just be honest. Nobody's going to be affected by this but you. Right? Nobody, nobody, nobody's going to, to, to have the consequences of, of, of your life but you. So this morning's a good time to be honest. Right? Is, is, your, is your life built on the rock? Right? Is it built off of God's word, his priorities? Or is it built in sand, on sand? Right? Self-righteousness, doing it your own way, thinking you're good enough. Are you obedient to God's Word? Right? All of it. All of it. Not just picking and choosing, finding what you like and leaving the rest. All of it. Are you committed to God's mission? Have you reordered your life? Right? Have you reordered, reordered your life? Is, is, is God's mission your priority? Are you still living for yourself and kind of fitting in Jesus along the way? Right? He comes first in everything. And then are you surviving the storms of life? Right? Or are you a Johnny come lately? Kind of seasonal. Right? When, when, when things are going good, you're here. And when things aren't going good, you disappear. Right? Because here's the reality. The storms are, are, are we, we all deal with the storms, but a final storm is coming. Because that's really what Jesus is talking about here in this closing of the Sermon on the Mount. He's talking about the final judgment. Because if you read back in there, he's talking about separating the sheep and the goats. He's talking about final judgment. So he's giving us a heads up, a warning to evaluate yourself now, self now because the day is coming where it'll be too late. It'll be too late. The foolish man's house fell, it says, and great was its fall. You might read right by that when he says it great was its fall. You know what that's talking about? Total and final destruction. Not, not that, you know, not just some of the shutters blew off, right? Not that a window got cracked. We're talking, it lost some shingles. Great was, was its loss. Total destruction. It's talking about perishing. Perishing. Perishing in hell is what he's talking about right there, to be blunt. However, the wise man's house stood because it was built on the rock. The difference between the wise man and the foolish man is the wise man had real faith. The wise man had real faith. So do you possess real faith this morning? Are you one of those that have been duped by a pastor? who sold you a false bill of goods. The good news is, it's not too late. It's not too late. Today can be the day where you place your life in Jesus' hands. Today could be the day where you have real faith. Let's pray, and we'll have a moment of response. Father, we're grateful again for your word. And Lord, I know, I know this isn't the type of message that many people like to hear. But God, you've, you've warned us. You've warned us in your word that, that, that you closed out uh, this great teaching on the Sermon on the Mount by giving this warning, Father. You warned this, these, these group, that group of hearers, Father, 
to evaluate themselves, Father, whether, whether their life is built on the rock or built on sand, because the truth is that we're all going to face storms in this life, but there's one great storm that's coming. Judgment is coming for us all, Lord. So, Father, I pray that right now in this moment, as we close out this time this morning, God, I pray that each one in this room would evaluate themselves. Lord, I've done the best I could to explain this passage. Father, I hope I did it justice. But, Father, even more than that, I pray that, that your Holy Spirit, God, that, that you are moving in this place this morning, that, that you are reminding those who have real faith of their real faith. And I pray that those that in this room this morning that have a, a false faith, Father, that, that, that you would convict them as well this morning, that they would know today that there is still time, that there is still hope. Father, that you would give them courage that this morning they would cry out to your son Jesus to be saved. And that today, true conversion would happen, Father. Today, true discipleship will begin, Father. That today, real faith would be theirs. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.